Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Robert Summercrass, Dean of the Terry College of Business. Uh, as always, welcome to Terry Third Thursday and to our uh, Terry Executive Education Center here in Buckhead. This is a place where we try to provide you with programs as alumni, as well as offering degree programs and just a, a base for uh, interacting for our alumni and the business community. Um, as I do every month, I want to recognize the sponsors of Terry Third Thursday because without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring you the quality programs that we do each month. Our corporate sponsor is uh, represented at this table over here, Bank of North Georgia. Um, thank you very much for your support. Uh, we have two media sponsors, Public Broadcasting Atlanta and Atlanta Business Chronicle, and they're represented as well. Uh, can I get our sports uh, sponsors to raise their hands and uh, let's uh, recognize you, please. <laughs> For those of you who uh, have uh, been attending Terry Third Thursday frequently, um, you've heard me talk about the Dear Run Fellows program before. This is a program that is a, a semester-long course which ends up with the students uh, spending a long weekend at Doug Ivester's plantation, the former CEO of Coca-Cola. Um, we choose eight students each semester for this program, and we have uh, only students who are nominated by faculty are eligible to even apply. So we go from over 100 applicants down to, down to eight, um, very highly selective. Um, we have a couple of representatives of Deer Run Fellows with us today. Uh, can I ask uh, our two Deer Run Fellows, Skylar Zhang and Chris Sanders, to please stand? <laughs> now, one of the reasons I ask our students to come to these events is so that they get a chance to meet some of the business community and so that you get a chance to see what type of students we've got in the program. So please uh, take a couple of minutes, uh, say hello to Skylar, say hello to Chris, and uh, you know I think they would uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, before we go into the, today's program, I want to share a bit of news with you, um, as well as some upcoming events. Um, we've been getting some really good news in terms of rankings for our programs recently, mostly associated with our MBA program. That's, it's that season. And last week, uh, Business Week ranked our full-time MBA program the highest that it ever has. We ranked 36th in the country. And I think even more significantly, if you look at the component of that ranking that comes from uh, corporate recruiters, the people that are uh, hiring and uh, hopefully uh, recruiting and training our, our MBAs, we found that we ranked number 10 in the country. So uh, I think that's a very significant achievement and, and certainly something that we can be proud of. And I want to thank the, uh, the MBA staff led by Rich Daniels, who is not with us today. Um, but it's, uh, it's a big moment in, in MBA for us. Uh, coming up in other events, um, we are hosting our annual Georgia Economic Outlook. That's going to start on December 15th in Atlanta at the World Congress Center. Uh, David Weiss of Standard & Poor's and myself will be delivering the forecast for the nation and for the state. Uh, and after Atlanta, we'll move to other cities around the state. Uh, if you come, you'll be the beneficiary of a, a lot of good information that I think you can use in making decisions. Oops, sorry, Steve. I'm running your presentation there, <laughs> giving a free view. Uh, uh, you can register for the uh, Georgia Economic Outlook on our website. Uh, finally, a word about upcoming programs. Um, this is, of course, the final Terry Third Thursday of the calendar year. Coming up uh, in the spring, I'll mention just uh, three of the programs we've got coming up. Dikembe Mutumba, Mutumbo, uh, a former uh, Atlanta Hawk and four-time NBA Defensive Player of the Year, will be our speaker. Um, Following that, we'll have John Crowley, uh, a biotech entrepreneur whose life was portrayed in the 2010 movie called Extraordinary Measures. And then uh, Lewis Miller, who is the general aviation manager at Hartsfield Jackson Airport. And with uh, transportation and logistics being such a huge part of Georgia's economy, I think that will be certainly an important program for us. Uh, and now on to today's program, which also uh, I think links up to Georgia's economy and the importance of transportation and logistics and trade. Um, from Georgia's coast, it is my pleasure to welcome Steve Green to Terry Third Thursday. 
Uh, Steve recently completed his third term as chairman of the Georgia Ports Authority, and he remains a member of that board. Uh, he also serves on the Bi-State Jasper Port Project Office, studying the potential for a container board port in Jasper, South Carolina. Steve is president and CEO of Stephen Green Properties, a commercial real estate and investment development company that he started in 1986. He serves as chairman of First Chatham Bank and vice chairman of FCB Financial Holdings. He sits on the board of directors of Georgia Power. He's also an innkeeper. Uh, two years ago, he purchased the President's Quarters Inn, which is a 16-room bed and breakfast in Savannah's historic district. And I and my wife can personally attest to the fact that President's Quarters is a very charming place to stay in Savannah. Uh, after graduating from the Terry College in 1971, Steve began his career working for the family business, Green Distributors. That was the exclusive franchisee for Frito-Lay products in Southeast Georgia. He was president of the company for 10 years, and in 1980, it was purchased by Frito-Lay Incorporated. Following the sale, he joined Frito-Lay as vice president in charge of trade development for the southeastern United States. In 1982, he left the private sector and moved to Washington, D.C. to become special assistant to Congressman Lindsey Thomas. Steve served on a number of appointed boards, commissions, and chambers. Uh, he was also chosen as one of Armstrong Atlantic State University's 75 most outstanding alumni. Please join me in welcoming Steve Green. Thank you, Dean Summercrest. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Terry School for letting us uh, bring our story to you. I'll, uh, as, I, as I get back to the beginning of this, I, uh, I'll tell you that Jim Galloway has a very, uh, very fine article about the importance of the deepening to the, uh, to the state's economy and to the economy of the U.S. And before I get into the slide presentation, I, I want to take this opportunity. There's been a lot of conversation in the press. I know all of you have heard about earmarks and the, uh, the, s the scourge that they've become. And I spent four years in Washington. I'll tell you that there have certainly been a lot of abuses of earmarking in the past, but uh, I think it's gotten a bum rap. It's really, if it's done properly, it's the ability of your congressmen and your senators to make certain that money that is going to be spent by the federal government is spent appropriately. And so I would say in 98.9 percent of the, of the instances, it's, it's a good tool. It's an, an essential tool in my estimation. It certainly is the responsibility of those elected officials to try to make sure money is spent properly. Otherwise, you just have the president write a budget with his bureaucracy and it gets spent. And that presupposes that the president is not a political animal and his budget is not affected by politics, which is, you know, probably not the case. But all that said, the, uh, the recent talk about the banning of earmarks makes, uh, since we're in a red state, and uh, there's a blue administration and they form the budget. It makes us getting the money for the deepening much more difficult. But I want to thank Senator Isaacson, Senator Chambliss, the entire congressional delegation. I'd, I'd, I'd be wrong if I didn't particularly uh, uh, praise uh, Congressman Kingston for his leadership in trying to get the money thus far that we've had. Mayor Reed has been a real champion He's recognized the importance of the deepening to the metro Atlanta economy and to the state's economy, and he's stepped forward, is helping us try to get the attention of the administration to get $120 million in the, in the 2012 budget. So it, it makes it a little difficult, but I really want everybody here to understand that earmarks are not inherently as bad as people talk about. Um, we have a lot of people tragically killed in an automobile accidents because people abuse the way they drive cars. But I don't think anybody says we ought to get rid of cars. So we ought to reform that process and make it transparent and make sure the abuses are taken out. But I just want you to think about that when you talk to your congressman about it because it's, it's kind of gotten elevated to the point of, of rhetoric and we're, we're really allowing ourselves to be taken down a road that may not be uh, good for the country. Take that editorial comment aside now and get into the uh, 
into the uh, program. Today's, uh, today's topic is preparing for to, uh, tomorrow's demands today. The, uh, and, <coughs> and this was the one audience I know, but no one, will, uh, no one will contest these figures because it was done by Dr. Humphreys at the Terry School. But the, uh, <laughs> the impact of our deep water ports to the state, 295,443 full and part-time jobs. The port and the port-related businesses account for about $61.7 billion in sales, uh, about $15.5 billion in the state's income. We, we account for about 7% of the total employment in the state. On a nationwide basis, the Port of Savannah moves almost 8.3% of all containerized trade for the entire nation. And it'll be even more important than I think, uh, particularly with the President's emphasis on, uh, on trying to double the exports of the U.S., we account for almost 12% of all containerized export trade for the country. This slide will demonstrate the, uh, and the, the reason that Mayor Reed has stepped forward. We have about an $8 billion impact on Metro Atlanta. The five top counties are Fulton at $3.3 billion, Cobb $1.3 billion, Gwinnett $1.1, DeKalb $764 million, Clayton $266 million, and the balance of the metro area, $1.25 billion. Our total tonnage this year was up 24,288,000 tons. Uh, we had 1,470,000 containers, and the industry jargon is TEUs, which is 20-foot equivalent uh, containers. We had 2,637,000 of those passed through, about a 9.7 increase over the uh, previous year. 2010, uh, we, we run from uh, June to July, our fiscal year does, and it really was a year of, of two tails. As you can see from this slide, the first five months right in the heart of the, uh, of the recession were down considerably. But starting in December, we've had a, an annualized growth of 23.2%, which is considerably higher than, than the uh, shipping industry or the port industry nationwide. There has been a recovery, but ours has been significantly uh, more dramatic. We're about 9.7% ahead of FY 2009. This chart shows our market share, and even during the recession, we were able to increase our market share <laughs> around the country and around the East Coast. On the um, U.S. East Coast, we're at 18.6% of all containerized trade, and for the United States, 7.9%. The port has historically been one of the most evenly balanced uh, between imports and exports. Up until about 2007, uh, imports were always slightly above, we would maybe be 51, 49, but they were always very evenly divided. Starting in 2008, uh, partly because of the recession when retail sales went down, because the bulk of our imports are retail, uh, retail oriented, the, the balance has shifted, and I'd say we're about 54% exports to imports now, which is particularly important because of the, uh, the imbalance in our, our uh, trade. And if the president's uh, goal of trying to double exports in the next five years is to be realized, ports like Savannah have got to get the deepening that, uh, that we'll discuss in a few minutes. Our five top exports by uh, TEUs were wood pulp at 175,654 uh, TEUs, paper and paperboard products, food, clay, and chemicals. Within that refrigerated exports, uh, poultry is by far and away the largest export we have. 70% of all U.S. consumers, about 215 million people, live east of a, an imaginary line between Chicago and Dallas. Within that 70%, 44% of the U.S. population were represented within that colored area 
And that's basically our, our trade, uh, trade area that is, is best served by the uh, Georgia Ports Authority. This slide just shows you the 47 trade routes that uh, service the port. We have 39 services, uh, primarily Asia through the, via the Panama Canal, but also Asia, India, and the Mideast via the Suez. North Africa, Oceania, which is uh, Australia and New Zealand, the Mediterranean, and Latin America. This slide will, shows you the bars, talks uh, about uh, what our trade has been over the years. We try to keep about a 20% gap between what the, our annualized business is and what our capacity is. Because we may, we may say we have 23% annualized growth, but it doesn't just, it's not done on a linear basis. So we have particularly, you know, getting ready to uh, increase the inventories for the holiday season, it, the trade spikes up significantly. So we, we have a one and a half billion dollar uh, infrastructure plan over the next seven years, Robert? Ten years. Um, where we try to keep a 20% uh, gap between what we think the annualized trade will be and what our capacity is. And uh, in 2010, we can handle about 3.5 million TEUs. In 2020, our capacity will be 6.5 million. We try to be as good an economic steward as we can. Ports have big ships and big equipment, and uh, inherent in those, there are uh, environmental challenges. But I, I think I can say without any hesitancy that we're the most environmentally responsible port in the country. This uh, is an aerial view of the Garden City Terminal, which is the largest single uh, container port terminal in the continental United States. Over the years, this, the green area is, is the, uh, represents where our ship-to-shore cranes are. When I came on the board, they were all diesel-driven. We've converted all of those to uh, electrified ship-to-shore cranes, and that's accounted for a 1.9 million gallon savings of diesel fuel. The blue areas represent our refrigerated reefer, uh, reefer racks that handle refrigerated uh, cargo, primarily co poultry, and moving that from diesel to electrification has also saved about 2.4 2 million gallons in uh, annual diesel consumption. We, uh, our rubber tire gantry uh, cranes, which move the containers around on the port, uh, we got a grant, uh, and that has allowed us to get efficiencies out of those RTGs, and we've saved another 129,000 uh, gallons of diesel consumption. And we've worked with the diesel additive to save another 100,000 gallons of diesel. So uh, we've saved about 4.5 million gallons of diesel consumption over the years. This chart just demonstrates how our container volume has gone up. The red line shows how our consumption of diesel has decreased, and it accounts for about a 54% reduction per container. We've completed nine major construction projects and have reused and recycled 94% of those construction uh, debris, an increased treatment of stormwater runoff by nearly 800% in the last decade. We've recycled 178, ton, 178 tons of scrap metal from operations and over 30 tons of paper. The uh, green shaded area is the Garden City Terminal. And this shows what we refer to as a last mile project. It's about a two mile road, which is scheduled to be let for contract later this year by DOT. Mid next, next year. Uh, and that's about a $120 million project. That will, along with the, uh, the Brampton Road, will complete what we have as a perimeter 
um, uh, freight highway, and we're the only port in the country, I believe, that has a perimeter route like this that can be used by tractor trailer and trucks. That allows us, let me go back, it allows us seamless access to two interstate highways. We're the only port in the uh, continental United States that has two class one railroads on terminal. And we don't have uh, a slide that, um, that I'm fond of which shows geographically the port of Savannah is about 34 miles up the Savannah River, past the main uh, central business district of the city. Most, most ports in the United States are in the center of the metropolitan areas because ports were one of the you know, primary economic drivers over the years. Cities have grown up around them. But today in the modern logistics industry, you need access to interstate highways and rail. For many years, this worked to our disadvantage being that far upriver. But in, in today's world, we, it gives us access to inexpensive land, or there are a few real estate guys out there that are in relative terms inexpensive, to build distribution centers that have access to the port and the interstates and to the railroads. And that's one of the reasons we've enjoyed such extraordinary success over the last 10 years. Port of Savannah has been the fastest growing container port in the U.S. over the last decade. We've had an annualized growth of 11.3 percent. And to put that in context with uh, our, our largest competitor in the southeast, which is Charleston, they've had a negative annualized growth over the last 10 years of 2.3 percent. But I would say to you that our success has not been at the expense of Charleston. It's been our ability to take port traffic from the west coast because of their congestion, their labor, issue, labor issues, and because of the cost of giving, bringing that cargo across the, the continental United States by truck and rail. A huge issue with the port today has been the, uh, um, the inability of the Panama Canal to allow the larger ships of the future to come through the, turn of the canal. Right now, the largest vessel that can transit the Panama Canal is 4,800 TEUs. They're in the process of widening and deepening the canal with another set of locks, which will allow vessels that are 12,600 TEUs in size to transit. Now, that is going to have an extraordinary impact on international shipping. The economies of scale that, uh, uh, that will occur when ships of that size can bring cargo from Asia to the East Coast is pretty extraordinary. It can reduce the cost of a, of a box by 20, 25 percent, depending on its uh, origin and, and destination. And that speed bump that the Panama Canal has represented will be eliminated in 2014, which is the centennial anniversary of the, of the original canal's opening. We were down with the governor last year just to and I'll verify that they were on track and on target, and I can assure you that the canal will be open. It may not be fully operational in 2014, but it will be open. And that is what is driving our, the, the necessity for us to get the harbor deepened to allow ships of that size, probably more realistic that ships that would be calling on the East Coast because of the the lack of deep draft ports will be in the 8,000 TEU range, but they'll be two, two and a half times the size of the vessels that currently call on us. Currently, our, our deep water depth at mean low tide is 42 feet. Uh, we have a, uh, what we call a SHEP, Savannah Harbor Expansion Project. Uh, received its, the reconnaissance study in 1996. And the Corps and uh, three other federal agencies, multiple state agencies in uh, South Carolina and Georgia, have been studying the deepening for 14 years. To date, we've spent $39 million on the effort. Uh, Tuesday of this week, the Corps released the environmental impact study and the economic study 
that's the product of that uh, that 14 year effort and that's now out for public review internal peer review external peer review that project that process will take approximately a year but we expect a record of decision sometime in December of 2011 and hopefully the construction will start in 2012. The reality is there'll probably be some lawsuits, but we're confident that the, that the uh, science will support anything. Hopefully, after a year of uh, such intense review, and um, there won't be one, but uh, my experience in those kind of things is generally there's somebody that disagrees with you and, and they wanna have a third party come in and, and referee it. So uh, the reality is that uh, this has some extraordinary implications for the, uh, for the economy of the state of Georgia and for the economy of, of the Southeast. Uh, so I'll be happy to uh, try to answer any other questions. I've got Robert Morris, who's our Senior Director of External Affairs. The uh, port doesn't like for the uh, board members to go out unsupervised. <laughs> and uh, I, I did want to thank uh, two people that uh, helped get me here. Penny Morrison Ross, who's one of my favorite people uh, at, at the Terry School and does such an extraordinary job representing the, uh, the college throughout the state. And, uh, and a dear friend of mine, Craig Bars, who uh, actually brought, uh, brought the idea of me uh, speaking and, and bringing the, the, uh, the port story to you. And uh, I have to share something about Craig, and I hope he won't mind, but as, as I have, uh, as I've gone through and gotten a little, uh, little more senior in my career, I've, I've always tried to ask people that, that I admired that had a lot of success, kind of what the secret of that success was. And so last night, Craig was kind enough to take me to dinner, and, and I asked him, I said, you know, Craig, you've had such an extraordinary career at Georgia Power, you know, what's, what's the secret of that? And I don't, I don't think you'll mind me sharing it with you. He looked at me and he said, well, you know, Steve, you can fool some of the people all the time, and I concentrate on them. <laughs> so, so I wrote that down, and uh, I think if you all take that, that, that lesson with you, it'll, it'll serve you well. It serves him well. But, uh, but are there any questions about the port? Ken, uh, let me ask that if, as you ask questions, uh, since we're making a recording of this for our website, for our podcast. Uh, please uh, raise your hand, get a microphone. We've got a couple microphones roving around, and that way we'll get your question recorded as well as Steve's answer. What are your thoughts on the security concerns related to the, the cargo containers? And what is the Ports Authority doing to address those concerns? Uh, well, we've been very fortunate, uh, Senator Chamless in particular, Senator Isaacson as well, have worked very closely with us in, in getting um, a number of grants from the federal government to help us uh, augment our security efforts. Obviously, we work very closely with a number of the federal agencies. We have uh, portals that we can screen uh, containers for in terms of uh, any kind of radiation uh, and we feel very positive about the uh, security issues of uh, the security procedures that are in place the reality is you know once the box gets on the ship and up the river much less into the terminal we've sort of lost the battle so the the big question is to try to interdict those containers on the other side of the pond and I'll, I would say that our, our federal agencies do a, a good job of that, but, um, but we work very closely with them in terms of uh, security, and they track the containers. They particularly are mindful of containers that are from an uh, origin or from a shipper that they're unfamiliar with. So we feel very, uh, very good about it, but the, in, in today's world, you can never have too much vigilance. I've got the microphone, I guess I'll go next. Uh, the growth at the ports has been an exciting story for Georgia, uh, taking share from the West Coast and maybe other East Coast ports. How long can that trend continue of you know, kind of growing 
faster than the, the overall economy uh, and taking share from other ports who I'm sure would like it back? Well, if you look at any of the projections, I mean, international trade is going to continue. I mean, we are in a, in a global economy. Uh, cargo cannot move uh, as inexpensively and, envir and as environmentally, environmentally friendly a way as an all-water route. So the future of international trade uh, via shipping is extremely bright. The only impediment to the continued success of the Savannah ports or if we didn't get the deepening because the ships of tomorrow uh, have got to have that deep water. And that is the only thing that would stand in the way of our continued success and our ultimate growth to uh, six and a half million TEUs. And that's with existing technology. It may be that, you know, the, uh, the industry gets new innovations that would allow us to get, you know, more uh, density, more capacity. But right now, we can triple the size of what the port is un under existing technology. We've just got to get the deepening. And, and that's going to become a funding issue at the end of this next year. You uh, didn't mention Jasper. You want to talk a little bit about the possibility of Jasper becoming a reality and when that might happen? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that one slide, but about halfway between the, uh, the mouth of the channel, uh, in between where the uh, GPA is located, and that's about 34 miles. 24 miles? That's why they send him out here with me. <laughs> uh, never let a few facts get in the way of a good story, Robert. Uh, 24 miles. There, uh, Jasper, South Carolina uh, has for many years had discussion about a container port being built there. Uh, Governor Purdue and Governor Sanford about four years ago created a joint Jasper project office, and I have the privilege of serving on that. The two states have come together. We bought that land from the Department of Tra Georgia Department of Transportation. It is where the, the U.S. Corps of Engineers, with their maintenance dredging, put the, sp the uh, spoilage from that dredging. And all of that bank along the entire river is just basically mud that's been dredged up over the years, put up there. Water's, you know, finally leaked out of it, and it's it's built up to, you know, in some places 20, 30 feet high. Theoretically, that's where uh, there's talk about building a new container port at, right now we project 2025. And I think that there's real opportunity to do that. Critical to that is getting the deepening. Without the deep water, then you can't attract, uh, you know, that project could cost two and a half, three billion dollars to build. We are currently uh, working on uh, the layout of that, the plans. We're putting in place, you know, when you would file for the uh, environmental impact study. The Corps has got to release that site as a spoilage site. Studies are being done now to figure out where they would be able to put that spoilage, what it would cost. It has to be a revenue neutral issue with the Corps who would pay for that. How would you get roads? How would you get rail in? So it's an extraordinarily ambitious project. I personally think that Charleston will, will reach its capacity of about 6 million TEUs. Within three to five years of the time that GPA reaches its capacity. And at that point, there'll be a real opportunity for a third, third container port. And the velocity of cargo that would come through those three ports would be extraordinary in terms of an economic engine for both states. So we believe that there really is an opportunity for that third port, but it's, a, it's considerably, you know, in the future. Unfortunately, there are elements within South Carolina that, as I alluded to a little earlier, they have not enjoyed some of the uh, recent success that we have. And the simplistic answer to that is, well, Savannah's grown at Charleston's expense. That's not the case. Charleston has some 
some challenges in terms of they have multiple terminals. As I mentioned, a lot of uh, a lot of the ports are in the middle of the met their metropolitan areas. Charleston has some of their terminals in the heart of their historic district. You know, on a good day, Savannah will have 10 to 11,000 truck moves a day. I don't know how many of you have been to the Savannah Historic District, but if I was running 10 or 11,000 tractor trailers into Recyclus Plaza on the river, we wouldn't be real popular. And, and Charleston has some of the, some of the folks in, in downtown Charleston in the Historic District are not excited about the Port of Charleston growing. So uh, with, the, with the deepening and widening of the Panama Canal, and the growth that's expected in the, in the southeast, Charleston's uh, terminal and, and their port are going to grow. They're going to recover from the malaise they've been in the last few years, and they're going to reach their capacity. Savannah's going to reach its capacity. The southeast is going to continue to grow, and it is going to need that third uh, shipping portal in Jasper. So I think it will happen. Um, we just have to get some folks in, in uh, South Carolina to recognize that the deepening of the Savannah River is good for the entire state of South Carolina and not focus too much on the city of Charleston. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Steve, um, how many ports actually have the capacity, uh, have the deepening right now to accommodate these new ships that are coming in? On the and East Coast? Well, there are only two East Coast ports that are deep enough now to accommodate the super post Panamax ships. New York has the deep water, but they have the Bayonne Bridge, which creates an, uh, uh, an air rights problem. And there is talk of raising the Bayonne Bridge, and that would cost about a billion and a half dollars if, it's, if it is actually possible. Uh, and there's also talk about relocating the Bayonne Bridge. Uh, also a multi-billion dollar expense. The only other East Coast port that currently has deep water and is, has no uh, air rights uh, restrictions is Norfolk, and that's because of the, uh, the naval ships that are located there. Uh, you, Charleston's filed for their reconnaissance study to begin a deepening effort last year. They were not successful in uh, securing f federal funds. Jacksonville has an application. Miami has an application. I think Galveston mm -hmm. down in the Gulf. Yeah. I, believe, I believe they also have filed it. The reality is I would, I would say to you that we need all the ports on the East Coast to get that deep water. That's just the future of, of international shipping. Uh, who the winners and losers are going to be in terms of that, um, Mayor Reed was, uh, was kind enough to arrange a meeting at the White House uh, with uh, Curtis Foltz, our executive director, and myself about a month ago with OMB. And uh, as the lady from OMB said to me, uh, you're 14 years ahead of everybody else. I said, yes, ma'am, we are. And that's the, that's the reality. In 2014, uh, the country needs a southeastern port that can accommodate the ships of the future and we're 14 years ahead of everybody else. But I would, I would be the first one to say that Charleston needs that deep water, and, and we should be supportive of that. And we, we need a third southeastern port. We're going to need a third southeastern port by 2025. And that may seem like a long time in, uh, in our lives, but in the history of the country, it's, you know, it's a blink of an eye. So. You know, the political leadership in South Carolina and Georgia, and we haven't had a problem with Georgia. They've been, they've been extraordinary. I have to say Governor Perdue in his administration, the General Assembly, even in the, in the terrible recession we've been facing, they have put over 100 million, uh, 100, $120 million in bonding aside for the state share of the deepening. Uh, so, they recognize the importance of the uh, of the deepening to the uh, to the state's economy, and our congressional delega delegation has also been extremely supportive. But 
we have some uh, we have some issues with our friends to the north. I don't want to make that sound like we're at war with South Carolina because we're not. <laughs> you know, there's some folks in South Carolina that uh, are, are being. Uh, what's the what's the right way for me to say this? They're being um, selective in how they uh, how they talk about the deepening. Steve, what is the relative size of Brunswick to Savannah in terms of tonnage? Uh, and are there any obstacles to the Brunswick port uh, becoming one of those depth-related ports? No, we, we completed the uh, deepening at Brunswick a few years ago. Uh, Brunswick is not a container port. They don't have enough, uh, enough deep water there to be a container port. Uh, they're the sixth largest uh, roll-on, roll-off port in the country. Uh, we have a very, very large, very successful, that's um, where you import and export automobiles or heavy equipment. Uh, and it's where we have most of our brake bulk and, and bulk facilities. So they have been very successful. The vast majority of, of what GPA does is, however, in containerized port, so in containerized cargo. So the Savannah port is you know, over 90% of what GPA does, you know, in, to, in its totality. But the uh, Brunswick port has been very successful in, in bulk and break bulk and particularly in Roro. And we don't see any difficulties or, or any impediments in terms of the, their water. Uh, we got, got their deepening done about three years ago. Your statistics on the environmental work that you've done are very impressive. Water is clearly essential to what you do. And I wondered what Savannah and other ports around the country are able to do to contribute to the cleanup of the uh, garbage uh, islands that exist in the Pacific and other parts of the world. And my second question is very much a layperson's. Those containers look mighty unstable to me. I wondered what kind of a storm it would take. <laughs> they have a uh, locking pin system, which is uh, is actually very um, uh, you know very sturdy. And I I would be the first to tell you that you know technologically I can't tell you how it works, but uh, but they don't they don't tip over very much. But now when when they do, they go down pretty heavy you know <laughs> uh, it, it's it's uh, if you ever have the opportunity if you're in Savannah and uh, you know call me and and we'll try to arrange a tour but it's, it's, it's extraordinary what our ship to shore crane operators can do in terms of taking those uh, boxes on and off and we enjoy one of the uh, highest efficiency uh, ratios in the shipping industry worldwide whereas uh, we're very competitive with the ports in Hong Kong and Shanghai and Singapore, which are, uh, you know, noted for their worldwide efficiency. So, but that's all done uh, by uh, eyesight. It's it's not done with lasers. It's all hand-eye coordination. It's pretty extraordinary what they can do, particularly uh, in windy situations. You get a box that size, which is, you know depending on what the uh, product is, I mean, just the box itself for several, several tons. Uh, it's extraordinary how they, they're able to um, load them and unload them without, you know, without it, very many serious incidents. I mean, safety record at GPA is, uh, we, we, don't, we don't rival Georgia Ports, I mean, uh, Georgia Power, which has a, a zero target, but, uh, but we do a pretty extraordinary job in terms of safety. It's one of our top priorities, just as it is at Georgia Power. And I can't comment about the trash islands because thankfully we don't have anything like that at, at, at any of our ports. Uh, so, I would, but I would say to you that they would have to work with the federal and the local agencies to try to resolve those problems. Okay, we got time for one more question. 
Do these big ships exist today? And are they calling on the West Coast ports? Yes, actually we had uh, the, uh, the Figaro, which is a French carrier, uh, CMA, CGM, uh, French carrier, uh, was over 8,000 TEUs called on the port uh, about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, Robert? Yeah, it's coming back in the next month. Right. But it, it, like any vessel of that size, is severely restricted by tides. So it had to, it had to come in on a high tide, and because of fog, it couldn't sail, and it was delayed about 18 hours, and it cost the shipper because of that delay over 200, $225,000. Plus, it had to sail light loaded, left a, a considerable number of uh, containers in Savannah because the weight of the containers and the the draft of the vessel and the depth of water didn't allow them to fully load. So it cost them $225,000 in lost time because they, they couldn't catch the tide and because of the fog they missed the second tide. And that's, that's really the issue about the deep water. We have to have that so the ships can come in. Even if we get the six feet, some vessels that size are larger. Will be uh, will be tidally restricted, and it cost a container vessel like that somewhere as around two hundred and fifty three hundred thousand dollars a day to operate. If they get to the canal Panama Canal late and they miss their appointment, they go to the end of that queue, and if they have to sit there for four or five days, you're talking about a million million and a quarter. So you know it's real money, and uh, and the shipping lines, you know, and people that are making capital decisions today about where they're going to build distribution centers, you know, where they're going to put the, the, the next string of, of vessel calls, have to have the assurance that we're going to have that water. And that's why it's just critical that we, you know, we, we get the final approval, which we're confident will happen, and that we get that funding in the President's 2012 budget just to keep the process moving. We have to be ready in 2014, and uh, you know the clock is ticking. Thank you so much. On behalf of our alumni board uh, and the Terry College of Business, Steve, I'd like to present this uh, glass sculpture to you uh, by local artist Loretta Eby. Well, thank you. I will. Uh, I'll have to tell you that. Uh, if any of my professors from my days at Terry School are, are still alive, if they find out that you actually asked me to come speak, they'd be stunned and amazed. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this concludes this month's Terry T Third Thursday. Uh, remember, as you're leaving the lot, just tell the uh, attendant that you were at Terry Third Thursday, and that'll be your way out of here. So uh, have a good holiday. <laughs>